My name is Monk Rowe, and I'm very pleased to have with me in Utica, New York, at the other side, Warren Smith. And I'm going to start out with an understatement. Uh, Warren okay. Smith has done a few diverse things in his career. <laughs> is that a fairly true statement? <laughs> That's true. I like to keep it around Robin, you know. <laughs> uh huh. Has there been one thing out of all the things you've done that has been your favorite? Um, I would have to say two or three, rather. Okay, you, get, you yeah. can have two or three. I, uh, the year that I left college in 1957, Harry Parch came to the college and did a residency. And I performed in his ensemble, rehearsed with him for the whole year. And then when that event was finished, we put all his stuff in a truck and I drove his truck back up to Ohio, the Yellow Springs or someplace Ohio, and then brought the memories in the truck back with me. Uh, that was probably the first really outstanding experience. What was your role in that music? I played an instrument called the bass marimba. Um, it was, his, his um, octave was not a tempered 12 key octave. His octave had about 43 tones in it. So he had a lot of microtones. But he had built all these instruments himself. And one I remember was a bass marimba that had four notes. And you had to play it with a handle, with a mallet that was, the handle was the size of the lower end of a baseball bat. And the ball that hit the instrument was bigger than, it was about the size of a 16 inch softball. But it was made out of, you know, fiber or, or you know, some kind. And you hit it, and this one big note, you couldn't hear it at all. It had 16 vibrations, and you could see it vibrating. You couldn't hear it, but you could feel the vibrations in your stomach. And uh, there are a lot of things about Harry Parts that I'll never forget, you know, but the way that he composed his music and rehearsed us and whatnot was just, that was uh, probably the first real professional challenge in my life, even before I got into the profession, you know, where I was making a living at it. Did you, at that time, start to think, that's one of the things I would like to do, what he's doing? Uh, the performance part of it, yes, you know, and the ensemble parts of it and working that hard was, but um, like the rest of school, there were other ambitions that I had. There were other tastes that I had that I couldn't satisfy simply within that one type of music. You know, I had grown up around Chicago jazz all my life. My father was a saxophone player and a teacher had notable students among them, Gene Ammons and Johnny Griffin, and these were kinds of people that I was used to being around and growing up with. Your father taught those two yeah. players? Those were two of the ones that he wow. taught. Wow. I mean, everybody, Charlie Parker came to Chicago and his horn needed fixing, so the first person he came to was my father. And we're sitting there looking at Bird, you know, and. And all he wanted was to have his horn fixed. But I mean, all the saxophone players came there to get their instruments repaired. You knew who Bird was then? Who? You knew who Bird was at that oh, time? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. By the time I was 10, yeah. well, first of all, you know, there were musicians coming in and out of the house all the time. You know, it was like a, a musical center because literally all the saxophone players came and others came and hung out, you know. and. My mother was a harpist, and she taught the harp and performed. Um, all of my uncles and aunts were involved in music on both sides of the family. So it was not um, unusual, you know, to just be associated with musicians. I had made up my mind by the time I was three, I was going to be a musician. And, um, you know, my ambitions never varied. And your parents were on your side with that. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not just my parents, the whole family. The family. You know. Sort of like a, 
the New Orleans family where it's just... Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, my father came from North Carolina. My, my mother was born outside of Chicago in Maywood, Illinois. And, um, you know, my, my, my grandfather had been a chef on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. So he was used to traveling back and forth from California and whatnot. And um, I didn't really know my paternal grandfather, but my grandmother, my father's mother, still lived in the country. So we'd go down there every year and visit with her. She lived to be 103. And that grandfather that I was mentioning on my mother's side, he lived to be about 106. And they were active, you know, they were walking around. <laughs> My grandmother, uh, my father's mother, um, was bedridden and had a wheelchair. And she said, one day my mother was down there and she woke up very early and she saw my grandmother up on her feet puttering around, fixing her bed. She said, Grandma Smith, I didn't know you could walk. She said, shit, honey, if these folks knew that I could walk, they'd have me working to death. You know. So. <laughs> So, you know, it was that kind of humor that just pervaded everything, you know. Yes. <laughs> so, you were born in 1934. Yes. So, if you can maybe, if you have a memory of in the early 40s, you, you were a kid. Do you think jazz music was something that the African American community embraced and was was proud of as a something that they had created. Absolutely. You see, we, we were, Chicago was very, very, probably still is the most segregated big city in the country. And where we lived on the south side, there were white people around, white neighbors, you know, some people were married to white people, but it was literally all black culturally, you know. And uh, the music was, something that everybody was proud of. We had shows um, where my father and my uncles had to dress up in tuxedos and, and shine black shoes and whatnot and go to work and come home. And then the next day they'd have to get up and go work in the post office or something like that, you know, whatever they did. But the music was a constant thing, you know, and it was literally a profession that, that we were all proud of. Nobody was ashamed to say that I'm a musician. You know, I mean, it was just part of the life. So you, you, your, your grandmother didn't say, now Warren, don't you be going in those blues clubs or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we had those cautionary warnings, but I mean, it was the fact that we were so exposed to a wide range of people, you know, people coming in town and out of town from other places were rotating through the family. And there were discussions of politics at that early age I remember discussions about communism and socialism, you know, in, 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 you know by 1942. Um, I remember when uh, President Roosevelt uh, brought us into the war. You know, I remember hearing those things on the radio. We didn't have any television in those days. Yeah, because you were about seven, Ten years old. six or seven, something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah between those ages. Right even before high school, you know. Yeah. Did you have um, intentions of getting an academic music career? I didn't have, you know, watching my father and my uncles do these great musical jobs and working in the post office, it was not my, I, and I worked in the post office. I spent five or six years, you know, from high school through college. And um, even my first year in New York to survive, I worked in the post office. But um, I went to school, uh, I enrolled in the architecture school, qualified for that and, and enrolled in that for my first year. And the only courses that I got A's in were the music courses that I took, you know, and I of course took uh, percussion courses and got in the new percussion ensemble, which was just starting in the early 1950s. That hadn't been done in colleges before. And um, even at that time, the thought of being an architect as a backup, I, I never thought about not performing music. Mm -hmm. 
But I figured that if I had to get a second job in order to support a music career, that I would rather not have it be the post office. You know, so I was going to be an architect. But by my second semester, it was pretty obvious that uh, all my A's were in the music courses and all my lower grades were in uh, architecture, you know, which, which I still love and have an appreciation for. So I switched into music education. And after that first semester, um, my involvement and my teachers convinced me to be a music major. But by the end of five years of, you know, switching majors and, and going through undergraduate school, I had decided that I would just get a music teaching degree mm -hmm. so that I could remain you know, and I wound up doing that for 40 yeah. years. But um, I, I never thought about not being a musician, you know. I, Gee, Chicago had some wonderful music teachers. Was that fellow named Walter Diet? Captain Walter Diet. My yeah. father played in Captain Diet's band. Wow. And Captain Diet had a summer concert orchestra. And some of my first orchestral experience, other than high school and grade school, was playing in Captain Diet's summer orchestra. And that was a wonderful experience, you know. Um, but, you know, music was always a constant. You know, the, the, we, we had stacks of old 78 L uh, RPM records, you know, and, and um, and we were listening to all kinds of music, you know. We were listening to Debussy and, you know, all the classical artists as well as all the jazz music that was coming out then, you know. Can you remember your first paying gig? Yeah, working with my father oh. in the Elks Club, you know, because the Elks Club would have a regular Friday night or Saturday night affair. And uh, my father broke me in as the drummer when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he hired a young baritone saxophone player who turned out to be um, my age. And his name was Lordine Pat Patrick. And Pat Patrick, of course, went on to be one of Sunrise, Sunrise. band leaders. And he came to New York. We did Broadway shows together and all kinds of things together. And in fact, we wound up teaching in the same college together, uh, maybe 20 years after that. And I, I just think it's so fascinating with yourself, and then you mentioned Pat Patrick, that you can play Broadway music and something that takes a whole lot of discipline, mm -hmm. and then you can be in an environment that is so demanding that you be creative and improvisatory. Um, I just think that's really interesting. Uh, the improvisation, you see, is, is a state of mind. You know, you, you, you have to kind of be, uh, well, you have to assume the attitude of, of, of having the liberty, of exercising the liberty to do that. We all have the liberty, but we don't always exercise it. And I mean, Charlie Parker came to my house to get his horn fixed. And Gene Ammons and uh, Johnny Griffin were my father's students. So you're listening to them, and they come in, and they, you know, Sonny Stitt would come from out of town. I got to get my horn fixed, you know, and everybody was rotating through there. And the discussion was more about the transference from swing into bebop because a lot of the older musicians uh, had an attitude about the beboppers. You know, they, they thought that a lot of them were not able to play. You know, they hadn't encountered a, well, Bird, of course, had that prodigious technique, and Dizzy Gillespie, and, and you know, quite a few people around, but that was not common. You know, you know, a lot of people were just, well, I can't do this, so I'll do that, you know. But um, I never had any doubt that all of these musics were legitimate, you know, and, and I had to learn, uh, even from high school, Richard Wagner and Strauss and Beethoven and all these things because I, when I first saw the timpani in high school, I started messing around with them and the teacher saw me, so 
he allowed me to play, you know. And by the time I got to high school, that was a regular thing. When I got to college, um, I switched into music so that I could have access to these instruments, you know. And I, I knew that I was going there, but I didn't know how far it would take me, you know. I never had the confidence of uh, being able to make the kind of living that I saw for myself just as a musician. Mm -hmm. Just as a performing musician. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That education uh, um, could basically help you pay your bills. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was the main thing. You know, I, I always said that these jobs financed my musical career. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's literally what happened because when I started teaching school, I wound up, I, uh, the first year I got to New York was 1957. And I immediately went into the school system because I, I, you know, I, the first thing I did was pass the exam to be a teacher. You know, you had to prove you could sight read and that you could articulate. But it, it was so crazy. I was being interviewed for my first teaching job in New York City, and a young lady from France was trying to get a job teaching French. And they were giving her all kinds of problems because of her French accent. And this was so completely ridiculous to me, you know, that, you know, and, and see, in these days, you had to sneak to improvise in the music school. So I would get myself locked in so that I could play around with these instruments and find out how to improvise. But if they caught you doing that, they would actually fine you. You know, it was like a 25 cent fine or, or you can't use the practice room for two days or, or some such. You know, there were all these kinds of disciplines. So all my life I was surreptitiously, you know, doing this on the side. And, and of course in the summertime I was playing with jazz bands and listening to all these great musicians come through the house and converse, you know, yeah. so I knew that's what I wanted to do eventually. But all this other stuff, even classical music to a certain extent was the backup for, you know, for a livelihood, for, for a living, you know. So your daughters uh, learned early on what a gig was. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Dad oh, has yeah. a gig tonight. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was never um, even a problem, you know. And, and in fact, it, it got to the point where even the girls that I dated had to understand that music was going to be the first thing. You know, I told my first wife that, you know, that music is, you know, of course that was bullshit because she wasn't going to have that. <laughs> and not knowing women at that point, I didn't realize that every woman that I encountered after that wasn't going to have that either, you know. But, you know, it still remained first in my heart. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Something you said st struck me because um, when you were talking about sort of the controversy with musicians and probably the audience too about swing and bebop that years later I've read about the same thing when people talking about free or avant-garde jazz that people would say yeah that's where people go when they can't really play yes what what's your thought on that well, I just ignored it because I, I definitely heard that all throughout my career, you know, and, and um, when I started doing, trying to do things, even, you know, uh, you didn't want to hear people, you didn't want people to hear you making mistakes even when you practiced. And you have to make mistakes when you practice because you have to overcome those mistakes and, and form a discipline around them. So. Um, it just, you know, uh, uh, well, a lot of things, you know, I, I, I kept quiet about it pretty much until I was at home and then I could discuss this with my parents and my relatives, but I thought so many of these rules were just completely ridiculous. So as many of them as I could get away with, I just ignored. I never had any respect for the law as, as uh, you know, the imperative design for the way you live, you know, for, or, or at least what other people thought it should be. You know, because there were so many things that my teachers taught me throughout grade school and high school that I just did not believe. You know, and I'd challenge this at home. I wouldn't challenge. I remember a high school teacher that um, she was a substitute. And she made the statement, I think I was in my junior year of high school, 
that a Negro never contributed anything to the building of this country, you know, which I thought was complete bullshit right then. But it encouraged me to study and find out the real history of the people who actually did build this country, which were almost all black because of slavery. You know, and there were other intellectual and artistic things that they were inventing that everybody was benefiting from and imitating that we were not getting credit for. Nor being taught in the school system. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the school system was just that way. You know, it was, I, I never had, I think I saw a substitute black teacher in my maybe third or fourth year of high school first black teacher I encountered, wow. you know. And I knew black teachers were out there because we went to the South, you know, and went to all black schools. There. In fact, DuSable High School, where Captain Diet taught, those were black teachers, you know. And all the people that we learned our music from were black teachers. And they were playing Broadway shows, they were doing concert work, you know, Captain Diet was, was conducting a classical orchestra and, and all this repertoire and stuff. I learned that, more of that from him than I learned from my own high school. I see. I want to uh, leap forward a little bit um, to make sure we get to a couple mm -hmm. things. Uh, one was the, the studio work you, you did in mm -hmm. New York. Yes. And you made a statement in an earlier interview that I read it might have been re referring to either studio work or Broadway shows, that you were in a position where if they needed a qualified black musician, I could be called. Mm -hmm. Was that because there was a movement that we have to start hiring some black musicians? No, or, okay. it was not that. It was pure racism. I, 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 I think so, because the people at the top were all white, and they were the ones who were hiring. All right? Now, a few black musicians that showed a talent that could not be ignored, or one that was needed commercially, were the ones who were able to you know, make a living playing commercial music, shall we say. Like Milt Hinton? Like it, Milt Hinton, like, um, oh, my, my memory Joe is, Wilder, is, perhaps? Who? Joe Wilder. Joe, Joe Wilder was one of my idols, and, and, and he and I worked together uh, on staff. But the first staff job that I had, um, or, or I should say the first um, television radio job that I had was at Channel 7, ABC. And they hired me because they had a special show, the Jimmy Jean show. And the conductor of that show was someone that I had done a Broadway show with. So he hired me for that show. And that led me to be a staff musician with Channel 7. And the only two other black people in that position were Joe Wilder and Ernie Royal. And of course, you know, their talent could not be denied. You know, so they were working regularly, they were doing Broadway shows and they were doing all kinds of jobs, anything other than playing with the New York Philharmonic, you know. And that was still closed, you know. In fact, one of my high school classmates was the first black man in a major symphony orchestra in New York. His name was Ortez Walton. And he played bass, he, he went up, and this was one of the first times that they did this. They, did a, they put a curtain on the stage so that the judges could not see who the applicant was. And he played the bass and he played a Mozart violin concerto on the contrabass violin. That's the guy I, I went to grade school and high school with. He was a year ahead of me. And he had a brother, he had two brothers. Uh, his, his older brother played timpani, which was my ambition. I took his place when he graduated from high school. And he had a younger brother who played cello. Uh, and both of them wound up, I know the younger brother wound up committing suicide, I think they both did. Uh, Ortez went on to the Boston Symphony through this means, you know, he auditioned behind the curtain. I mean, he was, he was playing jazz gigs in high school, you know, like, like at 15 and 16. He was going into 
New, uh, uh, into Chicago. We lived out in Maywood, Illinois, which was 20 miles out. He was going in there to play gigs and things. And, you know, I, I didn't know he was going to take this music that far, but by the time I got to the Tanglewood School in my last year of college, he was already in the Boston Symphony. So that gave me an ambition that perhaps I could do this, you know, and I wound up subbing in some of these orchestras, but I never, you know, that was something, I, I didn't want to be locked in just playing classical music, mm -hmm. for one thing, you know. So in the height of your studio work, can you maybe recall a typical day where you might do more than one date and just the logistics of how that worked and the variety of music? You know, with this connection into that Channel 7 job, which I got because of a, um, what was it, a television show or something that I did that led me into all that mm -hmm. and got me hired for that. Um, there were a lot of opportunities to do, you know, I'm sorry, we state no, no. that question again. I, oh, well, I, was, I, I just wanted to hear about your memory of it. A typical day. Oh, oh, yes, in the yes, studio yes. Scene. Now, now I fell into a pattern as a result of the contacts inside the studio music work and all of the other jobs that I had, where a typical week, say maybe forty weeks out of the year, because uh, leading up to Easter, everything was dull, uh, and it broke down after Easter through the summer and in the fall, then everything got busy again. But on a typical, say, late or fall through the winter into the spring, I might be called for a record date at 10 o'clock in the morning till one, and then maybe one from two to five, and then maybe have to do a Broadway show at night, or maybe do a third, you know. And I was one of the lesser people. You know, some of these guys worked four and five record dates in a day, and uh, five days a week, you know. And, and I fell into that pattern, and that got to be wearisome because you were never home, you know. You were, I was driving out to Long Island to, you know, go home, and, and my kids would only see me on the weekends, that kind of stuff, you know, because I'd usually have to leave as they were going to school, and, and it got, you know, where my wife, God bless her, was, was, was just a hero, you know, and, and just held up the family while I, you know, and, and all right, third marriage now, the same thing is still happening, you know, the, this woman, ha if I didn't have a good backup woman, you know, I, I wouldn't have been to do, able to do a lot of this, especially, and I wound up with, with five daughters, you know, four by my first wife and, and one by my second wife, and of course, um, They've all been, you know, through college and done their stuff, and I've got uh, five out of my ten grandchildren to finished college, you know, so I, I can't complain about how it turned out, you know. But it was a very rigorous thing, you know, and, and I probably wouldn't have changed if I had had the choice, because mm -hmm. some of those record dates that we did were just amazing, you know. Some of them were, you know, things that I didn't like to do so much, but... Um, those memories fade very fast. Yes, the, the, the down gigs, right. Yeah. Can you name a few things uh, that you've played on that are fairly well known? I remember a little guy came from Ireland and did something called Astro Weeks. What was this guy's name? Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Paul, oh, tell me his name. His name, the guy who did... Uh, Van Morrison. More Van Morrison. Yeah. And he was such a shy little guy, you know, and he had this big bag of vegetable leaf that he was rolling into these vegetable cigarettes. That, you know, I mean, uh, the smell was not marijuana, but, but he was doing this. And he would hardly come out of the booth. He would hardly speak to us. But, you know, he just brought these tunes out, and we just played them. I, I think that whole, uh, what was the, the, the big hit? out of that Astro Weeks album. Uh, um, uh, it's a lovely... Uh, moon Dance? Moon Dance. That's like, you on Moon Dance? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we did all these things in maybe like two sessions. 
you know, and, and the main problem, it, it was not him, because uh, it was mainly, it wasn't the music. The music was, you know, we had Connie Kay playing drums and, and maybe George Vivier playing, you know, all these masters, you know, I was honored to be among their company. But he was, I guess, our reputation, no, it was Richard Davis was bass player, but, but he was probably scared to death of all of us. And he very seldom even communicated other than, well, this is the next song I'm going to do or something like that. He was very shy and, and kind of reticent to, you know, express himself. But he didn't have any trouble singing the songs. He certainly knew his material. And it came what out was very the, well. What shape was the music in? Was it chord charts? Do you know? Was it well, see, a lot of the things were just, just lead sheets with, with the chord changes on them. Yeah. Occasionally there were certain things that were arranged. If he had an arranger, there were certain lines that we'd have to play. And um, I was usually playing percussion because I didn't have a reputation at all then as, as a drummer. And, and I wasn't a very good drummer, you know, because I'd been trained as a percussionist. I mean, I could play drums, but not to compete with the people that were playing in New York, you know. So, um, so I got a chance, even that was an education for me to see how these great drummers were actually handling things. You know, so though I was always being educated by my surroundings, you know, but, but yeah, yeah, Van was very shy, you know, but we did all this stuff in like two days, I think, like maybe four recording sessions, of about 12 hours of work altogether. I just have this picture of you um, telling your grandkids, you hear that song? <laughs> I'm playing on that. Sure, Grandpa. <laughs> that would happen every now and then. You know, yeah, that's you great. Know, and with my kids too, because because even you know they 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 know pretty much about my career. But I had five daughters. Neither of them would marry a musician mm -hmm. oh. ever. You know, <laughs> which was amusing to me. But they could see how sporadic that kind of lifestyle could be. And they all married men. I mean, I'm proud of all my grand uh, uh, sons, you know, sons-in-law, yes. uh, great people, you know, and, and at least I feel that one of my objectives, and I talked to them a lot about that, was to give them the judgment to choose a mate that would not be abusive or that was not an, you know, uh, an evil person, basically. And they all made me proud in their choices. You know, they've stayed with their spouses, each one of them. And, and uh, I actually have now five great-grandchildren. Wow. So, you know. You know, nope. bless your heart. You're, what, you're 83 now? Yeah, I'll be 84 in May. Okay. And here you are, um, basically on a road trip. Yeah. With a U-Haul uh, trailer <laughs> behind the car, and you're doing your thing, and I salute you for that. Um, which sort of brings me to, I want to talk about this music that, that you play and have played over the years with mm -hmm. Sam Rivers and all this. And um, I don't know what, do you like or tolerate the word free, as in free jazz? Because a lot of times the musicians who are playing the music aren't people that are they not the people that name it or label it. That's true. And, and I had received when I was working in the studio, I used to be criticized by the studio musicians for that other kind of music that I was involved in. You know, not so much the straight legitimate so called legitimate jazz music and so forth, but the free music that I was, because I got attracted to that very early. And one of the reasons I got attracted to that was because in school, primarily in college, when I started studying percussion with um, Paul William Price at the University of Illinois, I was introduced to people like Harry Parch and John Cage and, and all these other, you know, really out composers that were fragmented and I was you know, going to, I went to Tanglewood one year, and Lucas Foss was there, and, and uh, Bernstein was the conductor. And, and of course, uh, you know, getting into, even, even the people in, in show business, all of them didn't respect the pure jazz players. And the pure jazz players didn't think that the people who were playing this straight legitimate music were adequate improvisers. So there was 
a wall between the two, and I'm bouncing forth, back and forth between these walls, being criticized by both sides, you know. <laughs> Plus the fact that because I had a family, I was teaching school pretty much on a regular basis. I, I don't know how I was, but I was working literally like three jobs for, you know, 25, 30 years. You make me tired just thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, I think tired is a mindset. Oh. You know, I mean, I, I would, you know, all my life I was going to school, working at the post office and paper routes or, you know, anything else because we didn't have a lot of money. So, our, yeah, I worked my way for, uh, at least I worked for my meals by bussing dishes, sometimes being a short order cook and things like that all through college. Even when I went to graduate school, I wound up at, the, at Manhattan School of Music running the cafeteria to help pay for my scholarship, you know. But, you know, the music was there, so I didn't mind it. So if we can use the term free jazz for a while, in your mind, what is it free of? It's, uh, I think, allowing your mind to guide you in a performance that is not prescripted. All right, in other words, uh, I know a lot of people who you take the music away from them and they can't play anything, you know. And then I know other people that are noodling all the time. Well, I was a notorious noodler. Not, I mean, it wasn't a noodler because I'm sitting in the classroom and the teacher's talking. You know, and I mean, even today, you know, I'll be, I'll be lying in bed and, and my feet are going, and my wife says, Wah! you know, oh, oh, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I could never break that habit from grade school. I got into trouble for making noise that disturbed the teacher, you know. So uh, in 84 years, I haven't lost that somehow, you know. I, every time my mind wanders and I'm relaxing, you know, some idea, and sometimes I have to stop and write it down so that I can turn it into a piece of music, mm -hmm. you know. But the fact that I had this free, throw, uh, free flow of ideas going all the time, I think that's what your imagination stems from. And I think that I call us creative musicians, that is, musicians who don't need an outside stimulus to produce their musical thoughts. Outside stimulus meaning someone else has written down what they yes. want you to yes. do. Yes, somebody. Either so, real specifically or just in a framework. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see now, even like, like people like John Cage, for instance, definitely had a framework, you know. But he wanted you to infuse your ideas into that framework, you know. And I, I remember, oh man, it was, it was really weird. We were in the University of Illinois and Cage was there one day, and you know, you're, you're playing all this weird music, and some of it was written, you know, but he'd tell you to do something, and I did something unusual, and I'm looking at him down there at his seat, and I did it, and he like had an orgasm, you know, like that, some brief ecstatic feeling of something unexpected that happened within his music, because listening to him talk, he wanted us to infuse those ideas to enhance his music. You know, he, he had situations, he told us, where people would get up and walk out and slam their sheet down, and that was part of his music. It was his intention to stimulate those kinds of reactions. In other words, my music is reaching you whether you like it or not, you know. <laughs> but I, I took that for myself, you know, and, and it, it made me uh, able to accept people not understanding what I was trying to write or, or form as musical, you know, because I was hearing some things that other people weren't, and of course other people were doing the same thing. So I've been thinking about this. I watched a few things on YouTube that, that you were on, and then um, some other stuff that Joseph Daly had done. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to surmise if listening to avant-garde or free or extremely creative music is easier for people who don't know how music works. Because I think I have a bad habit 
of trying to compartmentalize things. If, if I'm listening to something and I'm listening, okay, I got the groove, or mm -hmm. I can hear the, the key, I can hear the root. And then if music comes along that it's not there, mm -hmm. I may have trouble with it. Not sure that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I understand that inquiry because um, you have to get over, uh, I guess, a feeling of rejection of the ideas that you present. The fear of that, you know what I mean? Because if you only want to please people, then you're limited by what would please them. You know, but sometimes the, my way of thinking is that you throw something at people that they don't expect and it will enlarge their audience. You know, I, I remember doing something once where uh, I had a, a prescriptive motif, you know, and it went something blah, 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 you know, just that. And I'd point to another musician and he'd do that, you know, in, in his own fashion. Another one, she'd do that or he, you know, and it went around. And I said, let me try something. I'm on the stage. And I got the whole band collectively to do it. Blah, 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 blah. And then I turned around to the audience and the audience sang it back. And I said, oh, you know, so the fact that you can actually involve the audience in yourself, you know, they don't have to actually have been familiar with the material. But if they can hear it, they will meet you halfway. If, have you ever had a circumstance where you try to instruct the audience on how to listen to what they're about to hear? Instruct isn't really what I mean. Mm -hmm. Give them a entry point. I, I think you do that before the presentation. Mm -hmm. you, you know, in, in your preparation, for the presentation, if you do that at all, you know. Some people uh, have a strong enough ego where they don't care whether you like it or not, but this is, this is what I do and, you know. I, I mean, I really try to reach an audience with my own compositions or, or performance in, in a way, but I don't let it restrict what I present to them, you know. And, and sometimes things come up that I don't expect or understand myself. You know, sometimes something can happen in an audience that makes you respond to it, you know, in some way. Um, and the thing that I liked about free music was that it gives you the room to do that, you know, uh, where, where you don't know what's going to happen, you know, at, at some point, you know. But I feel that the music that interests me most is the music that gives me some surprises. You know, because I'm so used to hearing consonant chords and resolutions and things like this. And sometimes you want music just like a, a, a decent play that leaves you up in the air, you know, and, and makes you resolve it yourself, you know, maybe mentally. I was going to ask you in some cases, how do you know when to end a piece of music that is basically being spontaneously created. It's, um, you, you, you have to develop a judgment for that. You know, you have to develop that judgment over a period of time, you know. And, and I feel now at this stage of my life, you know, after like 50, 60 years of, of presentation, that I can tell when an audience might be bored, you know. I, I can see restlessness, I can see people moving instead of everybody like this, you know. And you get to the point where you can actually, from the stage, almost orchestrate the audience reaction, you know. And, and, and if you have that big of an insight, you know, an experience gives you that. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you said, um, this thing I saw, that you like exaggeration. Who? You said you like exaggeration. Oh, absolutely, yes. Can you give me a couple examples? Yes, um, in particular volume. You know, now volume can go both ways. You can, you know, exaggerate emotion and play a very quiet sound, you know. Or you can start something very soft and let it expand itself 
you know, so it comes up, you know. Now, now these are shapes, you understand? But it, it's, it's, I think it's more akin to like a visual artist, you know, because you can paint these pictures in the air and the audience looks at them and, and responds in the fashion that, that eventually you, you can almost anticipate what the audience is going to do. Or you can say, well, I won't do that because I don't think that's going to be responded to well, you know. So that might be my only restriction at this point. I see. Wow, you got a lot of food for thought here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, uh, you mentioned before that out of the blue, you might start doing some physical motion and you kind of write that down. Yes. Now, that could be a kernel for a composition. Yes. And then do you assign like an instrument or something in your head to that? Maybe the marimba should be doing this. And you start orchestrating it. It depends on uh, my interpretation of the quality of the sound that I want to reproduce or that I want to hear reproduced, you know. Um, there are certain fat sounds, like from a bass violin, that you don't get from anything else. And percussion in particular has these qualities. You know, a bass drum is the lowest sound in the orchestra, you know, and you can hit it very softly, or you can marry it with a high sound, like a, a cymbal or a flute or, or something very high pitched and get that bass and it gives it a body that it doesn't have. It, it, it like allows one sound to riot on the other. And everybody feels that, you know. I, I, I was just talking with somebody, I, I, uh, I mentioned Harry Parks before. He had an instrument uh, called a bass marimba and it had only four keys on it. And the mallet was, the handle was like the lower end of a baseball bat, and the head was like a soft 16 inch softball. And you hit this instrument, this particular bar, and you could see these 16 vibrations. Physically, you could see them, but you couldn't hear it. But you could feel all 16 wow. vibrations in your stomach. Uh -huh. You know, and when you get sensitive to things like that, the, the certain sounds that are above your hearing capacity, but you feel something, you know, you can maybe feel it in your teeth or you can feel it in, you know, we all experience this in some way, you know, a car screeches and there's an anticipation, what's gonna happen? What's, mm -hmm. is there gonna be a bang after, you know, like all these things are like, we're conditioned to this, you know, so I try to take advantage of previous conditioning and try to manipulate that so it stimulates the reaction that I want from an audience. Wow. You've worked with some memorable musicians and um, artists over the years, and mm -hmm. I believe you said uh, you were talking about Max Roach, and he had an ego, you said. Oh, man, that, that, that was an education in itself, you know. I mean, here's a person who had a variation from piano to quadruple forte, even emotionally. You know, I mean, he could be the kindest, most loving person in the world, gentle, you know, but there were times when you could see him gritting his teeth and chewing his jaws, and you could see where something was about to implode, and he could erupt, you know, he could get, he, he and I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I guess, maybe a, an amateur psychologist. I like to read people, and I usually can avoid problems by anticipating somebody's emotions. But I remember a couple of times he and I got into shouting matches about something. And uh, something in me would never let me back down, you know. And we wound up being able to really get along well with each other because of that. But, but I mean, now, now here's, here's a musical genius, but he was open. You know, but he was also emotionally open, and that could go either way. You know what I mean? It, being emotionally open, he's vulnerable. So certain things could excite him, you know, or make him angry, and he might react. You know, if he's got the drum set, 
he can react with that, you know, but if the drum set is not there, you might be the percussion instrument, you know. So, <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, it was such a, I mean, he was, you know, I, I when the first music that I heard, I was watching Max Roach and listening to him, you know, and. In, in Chicago? Yeah, oh, yeah. he had his records, you know. Sure. I, I mean, he wasn't, he was like a teenager himself when I first heard him, you know, when he first started playing all these things. But the first time I heard him, you know, I'll show you how sensitive he was. I, I went to a club in Chicago called the Beehive, and a friend of mine was there. He was working with Clifford Brown. And we went and heard him. And um, Clifford's watching the audience when he wasn't playing. Max was playing, you know, and Max was playing kind of loud. And this friend of mine, you know, I'm watching on the stage all the time. He says, damn, man, Max Roach is playing too loud. And Clifford read his lips, and he turned around. I said, oh, shit, something's going to happen. He turned around, and he went back and whispered something in Max's ear, and Max diminished his volume. He responded to it. But he had that kind of respect for Clifford Brown. He wouldn't have accepted that from me, necessarily, or from another audience member. You know? yeah. but, but this is the kind of nuances that you deal with with, with an artist of this capability and breadth of expression, I guess, you know. It could go any way, you know. But wow. it, it's a great, uh, great lesson to observe, you know. <laughs> I love this comment you made about when you had, it might have been Oom Boom you were talking about or some of the other large ensembles, but you said something about everyone has a different idea of where the, the beat is at. Yes. And I, I can imagine that's got to be a little tricky. Well, well that, that was because, see, um, there's a certain ego about drummers. And, and they all have to be right when they're in the position of propelling a band. You know, the drummer has to be the most constant figure because everybody else can match that. It's, it's the most audible sound, and everybody can feel that vibration, so they can lock into that. But when you have six or seven drummers who are all, I mean, all these guys were great musicians, you know. Max had chosen us from his observations and, and experience with us. Now, every one of us could be right, you know. The only thing that, that, that got us over the first hump was the fact that we all had so much respect for Max Roach that we just let him lead everything. But when we started presenting our own music, and you might have to criticize Max Roach for something, then you wonder how that's going to go, you know. But see, he was broad enough where he could accept that, you know. Now, not all leaders can accept criticism of themselves or whatever they do. So they're locked in a position where if they're going over a cliff, they're gone, you know. And if you don't like it, just get off the cliff. I mean, just get off of their train, you know. So, but um, it varies with different people. Some, some band leaders, you can't tell them a goddamn thing, you know. And their music is going to stay locked right where it is, you know. There are others like Gil Evans. Uh, I'll put Max in that category. Duke Ellington was definitely in that category. He could tolerate any kind of crazy behavior because he knew what he wanted out of those musicians, you know. And I think that's a very important thing. It shaped my attitude as a band leader that I can be a lot more tolerant when things don't go exactly the way I prescribe because sometimes those ideas can improve your concept, you know, or, or give you something that you hadn't thought of before. So it balances out, you know, but you have to have an open mind to... To accept that, that yeah. someone heard something that you hadn't written or yeah, yeah, them. especially something that you write and you've just got to be correct and it's got to be this and that. And, and it's so prevalent. I, I did a lot of classical music. You know, I did a lot of symphonies and, and uh, uh, contemporary music in particular where everything is just so locked in, you know. But if you took the piece of paper away from me or the musical representation that said, play an idea, I could do that. There are some people that are so locked into that that when you take it away from them, there's silence. Right. What am I supposed to do now? You know, <laughs> and and I think that that's a detriment to yeah. to musical artistry. Yeah. Well, unlimited choices can sometimes be scary. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's something that, that's, that's a chance, you know, but getting out of bed every morning is a chance, <laughs> you know. So, so I've lived with chance all my life. Yeah. You know, I, it's never been like, well, I know I'm going to have a million dollars today and stuff to that, you know. Every, every day. But see, that's what keeps life interesting for me. Did you ever, ever uh, have an association with Sun Ra? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sun Ra was from Chicago. And um, a lot of my friends still play with Sun Ra. Some of my students, in fact, his concert master was a student of mine, Noel Scott. I, I had him for four years at uh, State University of New York in Old Westbury. You know, and, and in fact, Sun Ra was playing in my studio, Studio Wiss, he was rehearsing there. And a lot of these guys joined his band just because they hung out at my studio and were around when he was rehearsing. He said, well, I don't have a flute player today. Oh, you play the flute, you know, get on in here, you know. And he was just so open and so great, you know. But see, Sun Ra is also a band leader who needs, uh, how should I say, a congregation that is completely under his control. And most of, uh, well, I won't say most of them, but a lot of his musicians, he always had a big open house, would actually wind up living there with him. And, you know, having a family and whatnot, I could never devote that kind of outside time outside of my family. But I, I remember the last time I played with Sun, I, he was working at a club down in Greenwich Village called Bottom Line. It, it's, the club's not there anymore. I mean, the building is there, but, but the club is different. And at one point, he had us all marching around the club and around the exterior of the bandstand and singing shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand. Learn to march like a man, you know, it was a nice chant and had a rhythm to it. And we're doing, you know, and everybody's marching around, the audience is going with us. And it got to be time for me to leave because I got to get up and go teach the next morning. And he's still, you know, Sunrise doesn't have any concept of time other than his own ideas. So the last time around the back of the bandstand, I just grabbed my drumsticks off the drum and started to watch like a man, and I marched right out the door and went on home. You know? He never called me again after that. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it was great because he was so open and accepting of anything that a lot of people would do, and he got a lot of people stimulated enough that they brought some ideas out of themselves that they didn't know that they had. And that's probably the most unique part of Sunrise Orchestra, you know. But to be able to do that on a regular basis and have people that you depend on and count on, you have to have control of those people. And I'm not the kind of person who can accept that kind of control. So a lot of those bands I either didn't stand very long or had a very short tenure with. I sometimes wonder how he and other people who are doing that kind of thing could just survive economically. You know that there's a Buddhist um, theory of uh, your your ambition or whatever you call it. Your your amb I think it's, it's ambition is not a, a word, but your choice of life is to achieve a state where you have a lack of want. Okay? Now, a lack of want is knowing when you reach the point of achieving what you need and then being able to accept that as a level of your lifestyle. You know? So that means you lose the ambition of acquisition. I've got to have more money. You know, because these things are limitless in their appetite, you know, and, and, and that attitude I've seen so many people just completely lose themselves just in the quest for that constant acquisition of more and more and more, where they don't even enjoy what they have now, you know, and, and I, you know, I, we've elected that, you know, I, I'll say no more than that, but it, it's like people who don't know when they are happy, or, or aren't able to enjoy, you know, seeing your child learn how to walk or, or, or your wife be happy that you, you know, 
did something that, you know, appreciative of, of you know, and, and they lose that. So I don't ever want to get to that, you know, to that point. You seem to be um, an astute, astute, astute observer, and I wonder what you think of what the state of our country at this moment. I have seen presidents from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, and each succeeding one, and Roosevelt I liked a lot. Um, I liked John F. Kennedy a lot, and I am absolutely crazy about Barack Obama. I thought that he was the closest to my heart that ever got elected. But of those three, those are the only three that I favored. I didn't even favor Kennedy as my favorite candidate at that time. I, I, there was somebody else, Adlai Stevenson, was in that race. And I thought Adlai Stevenson would have been a more appropriate choice. But Obama was the first one that I, you know, when, when I first saw him, I called up my cousins in Chicago. I said, what do you think about this guy? And they all gave him a very good, you know, rating. And then I started watching him, he never disappointed me. I, I mean, you know, there were things that he was forced into that had to be done, but I understand that as a black person. I understand that as a president. You know, I've, I've been uh, a chairman or a president of a fraternity or a club or whatever, and there are things that you have to do that you may not want to do or your mind isn't done, but you have to do that for the good of the organization or whatever it is, you know, so um, nobody is perfect, but, but the rest of these people, I, I have not been in their corner. I have not voted for them, and, and they yet may, you know, were able to be presidents. I, I've never found a Republican that I could vote for since I've been a voting age. But other than that, um, I've, I've still been disappointed you know, for the most part. Okay. Uh, are you optimistic or, or Yeah, not? I'm optimistic that I'll be able to hold my breath for three more years. And, and then we'll see what happens, okay. you know. But I'm not going to be completely despondent if, if another poor choice gets in. Because I've seen poor choices get in and I've lived through them, you know. It just means that there are are areas where things might be a little bit more difficult for me, but temporarily, you know. So, you know, I, you know, I feel good about life, you know. I'll just wrap up with, uh, you're, you're doing a, a road trip here with a trio, with Joseph yeah. Daly and Scott Robinson, mm -hmm. who, by the way, if you recall, they said, don't say anything bad about us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're not here, so. Yeah. <laughs> but um, do you have a sense of what you'd like people to take away from your performance tonight? Last night we played, uh, this is only the second concert on the tour. The first one, you know, we usually get a good, but people came up to me on two or three occasions and said, I felt you. And if I can get that kind of a reaction, then I'm happy. You know, they could see that I was doing something that was reaching out and, and, and that they could grab and pull back on, you know. And um, I can't ask for any more than that. Yeah, because that's sort of open-ended too. Yeah, I, mean, I, I felt you, and mm -hmm. they didn't say it was the greatest thing I ever heard, or they, they I mean, it could be any kind of reaction. Yeah, yeah, I mean, how much have you heard? You know, you have to go into all that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when somebody comes up and expresses a personal reaction from your output, then, then okay, I've done my job. Excellent. Anything else that you would uh, have a chance to say that you could offer? Um, well, um, I could only say that, that I feel like I've been blessed, you know, uh, with a great family from my upbringing, you know, the, the 
knowledge that they gave me. I, I have been married three times and all three times were people that I loved that, that you know, my second wife is still alive and, and we have a child, you know, we're not together, but, mm -hmm. but it's not that there's any tension, you know, my third wife has been great for 20 years and, and I can't, um, you know, I'm happy. I'll, I'll, I'll be ready to go when it's time. Okay. <laughs> you, you were summarizing, you're summarizing your career at one point and you said, I was lucky, but I had to work my ass off. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you something. I was, I was lucky that I had to work my ass off because that put me where I am. You know, that, that gave me the strength and, and the foundation to do what I'm trying to do. So, so, you know, nothing's wasted. Well, congratulations on your, well, your prodigious you career. And I hope the weather works out for your tour and <laughs> you get to see some scenery on the way. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much.